Praise the Lord. Why don't you stand up? We're going to pray together. Father, we thank you at this moment. We bless your name for bringing us together for something good, something marvelous. We thank you because you brought us together to experience your glory and your power. I will pray, no Lord, you grant every one of us power for this present hour in Jesus' name. We pray that everyone here, the men and the women, the boys and the girls, the young and the old, the invitees and the long time comers, old timers, we pray, Lord, appropriate power to measure up and to match the challenges before us. Grant to all of us in Jesus' name. We pray for all our overseers, and we pray for all our pastors, we pray for all our leaders, we pray for all our workers. The challenge of ministry and the challenge that we face in doing your will, preaching your word. Lord, we pray none of us will quit, none of us will turn back, none of us will be afraid of any Goliath and of any Herod anywhere. The power for the present hour given to us in Jesus' name. We pray for our members who are suffering persecution. We remember some of the states where the challenges are very high and the situation is very tense. Lord, we pray at this time what the devil wants to do is to instill fear in the hearts and the minds of those who are worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we pray for all those members of the church who all who are born again in this church and outside this church who are facing such situation today. Give them, Lord, the power for this present hour. They will stand in Jesus' name. Lord, we remember those who have been threatened by people from the other religion. And it's like they want everybody to run away or to bend or to bow or to leave the way of truth and then come to falsehood and they do this and that and some believers are already beginning to fear oh lord i pray the present time requires greater power greater anointing greater unction and i pray that you grant every one of those believers suffering intense persecution at this time grant them the power for this present hour in Jesus name and Lord all of us in the church unite us together give us power together give us vision together and give us Lord the courage to move on together hand in hand heart to heart and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world in Jesus name Lord, we pray as we open the pages of the scriptures right now. You reveal yourself unto us. And take away from us everything that is in non-essential, unimportant things, inconsequential things. Turn our eyes away from them in Jesus' name. And give us, Lord, the treasure in your word. Bind us together. So that we'll be able to fulfill your will in the strength and the power of the Lord at this time in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you very much. You can see now we're looking at the word of God. We thank the Lord for bringing us to this retreat. The Lord has brought you in particular because he knows you have a need in your life the need of strength you are getting tired the need of power you are getting weak and he knows what has been behind you and he knows what you are going through at the present time and he knows the future that's why he says come ye apart and rest a little while so that he can fill your life again with a new kind of joy, a new kind of happiness, and then the tonic, spiritual tonic, that will be able to move you on until you get to your destiny, that destiny you are going to get there in Jesus' name. 
you know the times in which we are living this is a difficult time and the lord wants us to even get greater success and greater skill and greater achievement even in this difficult time you're going to see some things in the bible and i'm praying that you'll call me to the picture in jesus name i'm saying that heaven is taking a photograph it's taking a picture and then you say i'm here i'm here you're going to be in the picture in jesus name can i show you something in daniel daniel chapter 9 i want to show you that even in troublous times in terrible times in difficult times in traumatic times yet we keep on building in fact the time to have the greatest success it's when the difficulties are there when the challenges are there that's why i came together to this retreat so that this trying time and this traumatic time and this troublous time will still be able to have everything the lord wants us to have you will not miss any good thing in your life in jesus name we're looking at daniel chapter 9 verse 25 know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to, the, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. This is what I'm pointing you to now, the last part. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. The streets and the walls built, even in troublous times, when things are dangerous, when things are kind of perilous, when the times are tough, that's not the time to check out, that's not the time to bench, that's not the time to give up, it's the time to build, because we have the power to sustain us even in troublous times. We're looking at Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. That's going to be a dangerous time when corruption is everywhere. And the power, the spirit of the Antichrist is influencing everyone by his flattery. Yet look at that. It says, but even at such a time but the people that do know their god shall be strong and do exploits that's what i'm telling you that these perilous times are not the times to check out they're not the times to give in to the enemy they're not the times to give up and just say well there's nothing we can do the adversaries are so many the challenges are so great the mountain is so high and the road is so rough therefore there's nothing we can do of course there's something we can do at such a time when difficulties multiply that's when you put in your bare strength because there is power for the hour we're looking at first corinthians chapter 16. first corinthians chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 9 for a great door and effectual is opened unto me and there are many adversaries you see everything together you see everything together the troublous times and the power to build and then the treacherous time the time of flatteries and corruption and yet the people of god rising up in the strength and the power of the lord and doing exploits and now the time of adversity adversaries multiplying and yet great door opened unto the people of god i said that's why the lord has brought us together so that we can this time face the challenge of the day and do what he wants us to do and we're going to accomplish in jesus name this church is going to go places it's going to succeed it's going to accomplish but we're going to do that together as a team as a team i want you to write that word team t-e-a-m t-e-a-m i'm talking on unity and humility there is humility in unity there is unity in humility we're talking about a team t 
E A M. That means together, T for together. E everybody. A accomplishes. M more. A T together. Everybody accomplishes more. Not only the pastor, not only the ministers, not only the workers, not only the members, everybody together. Everybody accomplishes more. Not only the men, not only the women, not only the boys, not only the girls, together. Everybody accomplishes more. Not only the preachers, not only the singers, not only the prayer warriors, together, everybody accomplishes more. Unity. The Lord is wanting us to think about our future. The Lord is wanting us to think about the future of the body of Christ, the future of the church, the local church, the church in the community, the church in the local government, the church in a state, the church in a nation, the church in a region, the church in the cities. Together, everybody accomplishes more. And you know, if there is a civil war, you cannot fight an international war. If there is tribal conflict, you cannot win against the enemy coming from outside. It's together. It's when there is unity inside. Unity in the home. Unity in the family. Unity amongst us in the church. Then the enemies coming from outside will be able to overcome them. If you're going to fight an international war successfully, warfare, spiritual warfare, inside there must not be any conflict. If you're fighting within the body, within the family, then we're going to disintegrate. But when we understand our success over the enemy, our success over the outsiders wanting to destroy the church our success depends on an internal unity here together everybody accomplishes more that's why before jesus went away he prayed for the church the church at that time his own disciples that's why we're considering that prayer prayer for unity and power for humility we're looking at john chapter 17 john chapter 17 i'm reading to you from verse 20 neither pray i for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word it's telling us there are two groups there these those who are present and them that would believe on his word and believe on him through the word of those apostles those are those are the people sitting here now those are the people hearing the word of god now that they and us will be united he prayed for them and he prayed for us verse 21 that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Have you noticed something there? It's saying there is a battle for the souls of the people of the world. And the only way those people of the world can be one is that they will believe. And the only way they will believe is that we who are in the church will be one. Let's say, for example, there are invitees here, unbelievers here, ready to become believers. There are sinners here, ready to become saints. There are people outside the kingdom, ready to come in, into the kingdom. And the Lord is saying for those sinners to believe. For those sinners to be born again. For those sinners still in the world to come out of the world into Christ, into salvation. It is going to depend on our unity. Look at that again. In verse 21, that they all may be united, all may be one. As our Father art in me, and I in thee, 
that they also may be one united in us what's going to be the result that the world may believe that thou hast sent me if there's disunity in the congregation disunity in the church the world will not believe what's our purpose of coming together what's the purpose of the retreat to get so saved to get unbelievers to believe to get the people of the world convicted of their sins and to come to the lord and if the church is having that purpose and that goal there will be visible unity they all may be one as our father that in me and i in thee that they all may be one no dissenting voice no contradictory action because it is that unity that gets the world to believe we're looking at verse 22 and the glory which thou gavest me i have given them that they may be one even as we are one that gives us another realm it says i want my glory to be upon the church my power to be on the church and these are the purpose of that that they may be one in us that means then the glory of god the majesty of god the power of god coming on the church remaining on the church abiding in the church like fire the glory glory cloud upon the church depends upon our unity it says that they may be one as we are one verse 23 i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one once again is saying our perfection the perfection of the church the maturity of the church depends on our unity and then it goes on and that the world may know the world will never know if we're not united because they are going to think that they who are in the other religion they're so united among themselves and those in secret cause are so united among themselves and the people who are fighting against christ and against the church they're so united among themselves and they say we don't have grace we're united we are not born again we're united and we don't have the holy ghost talking in tongues like you do and we are united and we focus on what we want to do and we are united and they're telling us that you know the education board in every country has to be united and the army in any country they are united and all these other sections of society we don't claim to be born again we don't claim to be holy 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 we are united how is it then that those people they say they represent christ they're not united we don't accept that we don't trust them we don't believe them if they are united under satan and we are not united under christ the glory will not be upon us that's why it says that the world may know that thou hast sent me the world will never know that christ has been sent to be the savior of the world if we are not united do you see the reason why jesus took time apart he was facing the cross he was about to die and yet he said father i want to request something from you that these disciples i'm leaving behind that they will be united because if the church is not united the death of christ on the cross of calvary will be in vain and you want to think about that in your own mind your own heart that if you want calvary to have an effect on the world if you want the sacrifice of christ to have an impact on the world there is something you must do there's something i must do team together everybody accomplishes more together everybody accomplishes more that's a team that's unity that's why jesus said that the world may know that thou hast sent me and that thou hast loved them as thou 
has loved me. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're looking at it from verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. It says, humility is part of the unity. Not to concentrate on himself. Not to be building up himself to destroy other people. Lift up himself and then relegate others to the background. Don't you ever think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Can I, you know why it's saying that? You know, sometimes when somebody comes out and then he looks at himself and he says, Hey, I'm important, I'm essential, I'm indispensable. The world cannot deal without me. I can deal without the rest of the world. I'm the champion, I'm the all in all. You couldn't come out if you didn't wear a dress. You don't know how to make clothes. You are not a tailor. You are not a manufacturer. You are not in the textile industry. You have to depend on somebody else. Even to have clothes to wear. Come on here now. Look at the shoes you wear. You couldn't make the shoe yourself. I know some of you there, you need a pair of glasses to be able to read. I know you have a Bible and you have good brain and good mind and you are born again and you are sanctified and feel what the Holy Ghost. You need somebody, the, you know, those optometrists, to be able to give you the glasses there. How about it now? The bed you slept on at night, somebody did that. You couldn't be alone by yourself. I'm reminding you again, together, everybody accomplishes more. You need me, I need you. We need one another. That's why it says, don't so exalt yourself and feel that you are the all in all. I am not all in all. You are not all in all. It's together. It's together. It's together. That's why it says, I'm telling you, through the grace given unto me, to every man, everyone that's among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly according to, as god has dealt to every man the measure of faith he gives you a measure he gives me a measure he gives him a measure he gives him over there a measure i bring that measure and this measure and this measure and this measure and the measure over here at the pulpit will bring all the measures together together everybody accomplishes more that's the unity that's the humility you are not all in all i am not all in all there's humility with the unity too look at verse 4 for as we have many members in one body and all the members have not the same office so we being many are one body in christ and every one members one of another that tells us the humility that ought to be in the unity i'm going to look at this prayer for unity and power for humility under three subtitles number one the primary purpose of saints unity the unity of saints saints in the plural the primary purpose of saints unity number two the proper perception of scriptural unity when well, we're talking about unity what's the understanding what's the perception the proper perception of scriptural unity number three profitable promotion through sustained humility profitable promotion through sustained humility you know the people that try to exalt themselves and promote themselves they invite themselves to honor and the lord says no it's not given that way the promotion which is profitable there are some kinds of promotions that are not profitable you know like the promotion of absalom he promoted himself Oh, that I were made a judge in the land and eventually he got to that position but you know the end story. That's an unprofitable promotion. You remember Naboth? Naboth had a vineyard. 
And then Ahab said, can you give me the vineyard? And then I'll give you money for it. He said, no, I'm sorry. I cannot give you the inheritance of my fathers unto anybody. And then Jezebel planned his promotion. And then he said, when he's promoted, let false witnesses come. Let them say this and that, and then kill him. That's the kind of promotion that's unprofitable. We're talking about promotion that is profitable through sustained humility. Number one. What's number one? The primary purpose of saints, unity. It has a purpose. It has a purpose. Always have that in mind. Before I go to the saints' unity, I want to differentiate this from the sinners' unity. Sinners' unity. The Lord is not calling us to sinners' unity. He's calling us to a saints' unity. There's a kind of unity among sinners that, you know, if you ask A, he says this. You ask B, he says the same thing. And they're sinners. They're united together. Look at Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verse 9. Acts, chapter 5, verse 9. The Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? And Ananias and Sapphira, they were united. But they were united until death. They were united into hell. That's not the kind of unity the Lord is telling us to have. Unity between Sapphira and Ananias. The unity between the people that built the tower of Babel. And he said, let us go to and let us build a tower. They were united in vision, united in purpose, united in their plan, united in the project. But that unity, the Lord scattered them. Not that kind of unity. Now, another kind of unity the Lord is not talking about. We're not talking about the unity between saint and sinner. Saint and sinner. A non-believer and a believer. No, not kind of unity. Second Chronicles chapter 19. Second Chronicles chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 2. And Jehu, the son of Ananai, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Jehoshaphat was a good man. Ahab was a bad man, an evil man. And they became united to go and fight in the battle. And when he came back, the prophet of God said to him, What have you done? You've gone into unity with somebody who hates the Lord. Because of that, the wrath of God is upon you. We need to clarify that because, you know, there are people that do not, they don't know about salvation. They don't want to know about salvation. All they know is religion. They burn their candles and blow their incense and they carry their cross or whatever it is they carry they don't want to hear that we must repent we must be born again we must be children of god and if anyone is born again born of god he does not continue in sin they don't want to hear that but they say jesus prayed for our unity let us all come together because we must be united no it's not the unity between sinners number one number two it's not the unity between saints and sinners that's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Do you know that Jesus prayed for the unity of the church and yet he never told his own disciples to unite with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. To unite with the people that sit in Moses' seat and they say, but they do not. And those people, those Pharisees, they'll go and they make proselytes, make disciples. And the people they influence, they become twofold children of hell than, they, than themselves. Jesus never told these people to unite with them. He said, I called you out of the world. You are not of the world. Just like I am not of the world. The unity we're talking about is not between saints and sinners between believers and backsliders 
between the people that uphold the truth and the people that want to drag down the truth. Look at it in that verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, what are the next two words? Tell me out loud. Go in. Unite with them. What does it say? Wherefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Saints, unity. Unity among saints. That's what the Lord Jesus prayed for. Now, what's the primary purpose of that unity? What's the reason for that unity? Now, let's come back to john chapter 17 again john chapter 17 and you see the primary purpose why we're united together and why the lord is praying for us saying get united be one that they all may be one as our father at in me and i in thee that they all may be one in us we're looking at john chapter 17 verse 21 that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe so that the world may believe in order that the world will believe that thou has sent me was the primary purpose evangelization was the primary purpose soul winning was the primary purpose children being born into the kingdom why are we to be united not just to feel good to feel happy to feel joyful of course yes when we're united we feel happy when we're united we feel great emotionally it's like this is good it's a pleasant thing it's a good thing for brethren to be united together we feel good emotionally up but that's not the purpose the purpose is so that the world will believe acts of the apostles chapter 2 verse 1 and when the day of pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place. Were they united? I said, were they united? Yes, they were. Remember, what's the purpose now of that unity? You must always remember that together, everybody accomplishes more. In unity, the strength. In unity, we can evangelize successfully. In unity, we'll be able to fulfill the Great Commission. In unity, we'll be able to get people out of hell, out of the way that leads to perdition, and get them to the way of heaven. That is the purpose of unity. And so, as you live with Christians, abide with Christians, dwell with Christians, worship with Christians, and as you fellowship with us, as you are coming in into the church building, you say, Lord, I want my life today. I want my interaction today. I want my presence today to bring a soul into the kingdom. I may not be the preacher. I may not be the singer. I may not be the usher. I may not be the whatever, but oh Lord, let my presence fulfill the purpose why you came to the world. And that is to bring people unto the Lord Jesus Christ. They were all with one accord in one place. Look at the result. We are told in verse 14. In verse 14, but Peter standing up with the 11. What a minute. Who chose Peter to stand up? Who told Peter that he will be the preacher? There are 12 of us and somebody just gets up remember once again in unity there is strength 
and the togetherness will make them to be able to evangelize. That's what they didn't argue about Peter. You've started again. Peter, give me some chance. Why well, see that you always be the spokesman and now the people, we have not even decided, we have not voted and we have not selected anybody and there you are. Wait a minute. Unite together. And if Peter is speaking, let John and James and Matthew and the rest of them keep quiet. Let's support him. Why are we supporting him? Because he's a great man. No. We're supporting him because if we are united, the world will believe. And when Peter rose up to talk, all the people that were speaking in tongues, everybody kept quiet. Because now Peter was going to address the people. And they saw the unity. And the people paid attention because they knew that this was of God. Look at the result in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about how many people? 3,000 souls. That's the purpose of the unity. So that the world will believe. What if they were not united? What if they were arguing? When Jesus was alive, they wanted to know who is the greatest among us. What if that argument continued? That's why Jesus prayed for their unity. And then we're told in verse 42, verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Have you noticed here, it was Peter that preached. And he didn't say they all continued in Peter's doctrine. It was Matthew that wrote, and Mark and Luke that wrote, and John that wrote the Gospels. They didn't say, and they continued steadfastly in John's doctrine, Matthew's doctrine, Luke's doctrine, Mark's doctrine, in the apostles' doctrine. They were united. And then it says, and in fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles by the apostles well i've not seen the one recorded about matthew signs and wonders i've not seen the one recorded about Bartholomew signs and wonders i've not seen the one recorded concerning james signs and wonders but signs and wonders were done by the apostles you see the unity there and nobody claiming i was the one that did that i was the one responsible for that their unity brought a lot of souls into the kingdom it tells us in verse 44 and all that believed were together all that believed were together and had all things come on and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need and they continuing daily how tell me out loud how did they continue with one accord they started with unity they continued in unity and i pray that you'll be the same with us in jesus name but you know the lord had prayed for their sanctification and as one of the great great evidences of sanctification that we united together and, and it's not just for your own sake it's for the sake of the world that the world will believe that the father had sent jesus christ and in believing they will be saved they continued daily with one accord in the temple and in breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising god and have and having favor with all the people and the lord added to the church how often did he add to the church daily such as should be saved you can see the unity there the unity brought salvation and you know the greatest in the mind of christ is salvation of the world the greatest in the mind of christ is not just you know for the church here it will be big yes it's good to be big but there are many people outside 
You know, sometimes when you look at, you know, the church, how large we are, you think that everything is done. This is just a small percentage of the people of Lagos State. And in all the locations where we're having the retreat, we see them spread out in their thousands. And those people at those retreats will say, hey, this is great. I want to remind you, those thousands you see there on your retreat ground, they're just a small percentage of your city, of your region, of your state. And when you're all united together, the people in the world who are watching and they're looking at us, they will say how united we are, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Let's look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the reason why Jesus came. He loved the world so much. God loved the world so much. The people in the world, he wants them to be saved. And if your mind is the mind of Christ, if what passion, the passion Jesus Christ had is the passion you have, and then you want the world to be saved, you say, because of the world, for the sake of the world that ought to be saved, that will believe, because of that we're going to be one. Look at verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might believe. That's what he wants to do. That's why he brings us together. Now we need to understand what kind of unity we're talking about. That brings me to point number two. Point number two, the proper perception of scriptural unity. Proper perception of scriptural unity. And we need to understand what the Lord is calling unity. There is a difference between union and uh, unity. There's a difference between sitting together on the same bench and thinking together in the same direction. There is a difference between just verbally, openly saying, I agree, we are together. And then the thoughts in our heart, the direction in which we are moving. That's why the Lord tells us what kind of unity he was praying for. Proper perception of scriptural unity. John chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. You see that? All thine are mine. All mine are thine. That's unity. My failure is your failure. Your failure is my failure. Your success is my success. My success is your success. That's unity. When I want to succeed and I carry out my plan for me to succeed and make you fail, when I be in the same church, attending the same retreat, believing the same doctrine, but a has the desire to succeed, to shine, to overcome, to be prospered. And A wants to do that in such a way that B will fail, will be a fool. That's no unity. It says, all thine are mine, and mine thine. That means then, everything you have, I have. Your joy is my joy. My happiness is your happiness. I'm walking not for my joy. I'm walking for your joy. You are walking not for your happiness. You are walking for my happiness. That's the unity the Lord is talking about. If that kind of unity is not there, then we don't have the experience that Jesus paid for. Look at verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine, thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. That's the unity Jesus prayed for. You know, all these people that are saying we should be united. 
They're telling us a deeper life. Let's get united. Jesus prayed for unity. And I'm saying, yes, we want to be united. What's the price we pay? They say, doctrines divide. If we're going to be united, drop your doctrine. And it's not my doctrine. It's the doctrine of the Bible. And say, so tell me, which one do we drop? You drop sanctification. You drop holiness. You drop conditional security. Tell everybody, like we are telling them, everybody will be saved. No matter what you do. And then you are saying that we must keep in the faith, abide in me, and let my word abide in you. They say, drop all that. They're telling us to drop the words of Jesus. They're telling us to drop the Lordship of Christ. They're telling us, drop this and drop this and drop that. And you look at us the way we are. And you say, we are worldly. Drop that language. Don't say that again. Just say, God loves everybody. If you are conformed to the world, if you look like the world, drop all that. Believers, money, non believe, drop that one. And then just, just all be together. If you drop all the doctrines and drop all your convictions and you're no more honestly content for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, once you do that, we'll be together. And you know that sometimes it happens even within the church. We preach the word of God. And we say we believe the word from cover to cover. And that we're not going to remove an iota. We're not going to remove any part of it. You know, sometimes we preach the word of God. And that word of God may strike you. That word of God may touch you. That word of God may correct you. And say, my brother, this is wrong. This is wrong. How can this be? And even though we say we're united, we're the same church, and we're right over here, honestly contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints. And when somebody preaches something, reads it from the word, interprets it correctly, and then it affects you, then you say, drop that. Don't talk like that. You don't preach the truth. Anytime you know the truth is going to affect me. Anytime you know that your interpretation of the word of God is going to make me correct something, drop it. Then we'll be united. That's not the unity Jesus prayed for. The unity Jesus prayed for is that we will be united as the Father and the Son. As they're united. The Father didn't have to drop anything for Jesus to be in agreement with him. And Jesus did not have to drop anything before the Father were united together with him. The unity we're talking about is unity in the world, not unity outside the world. Verse 21 again, in verse 21, that they all may be one as thou Father Arch in me and I in thee. You know the kind of nature we're talking about is if you could come into my heart and be in me. You know the thought I'm thinking about you. You know the plan I'm planning about you. If I could come into your heart and see the way you reason when I'm standing here or when I'm walking there or when I travel out. If I could come into your mind, the thought you are thinking about me, I will agree. And the thought I'm thinking about you, you will agree. That's the kind of unity the Lord is calling us to. Not this kind of superficial union. That although we say we're together, internally inside us, our thoughts are not in agreement with one another. And then it says in verse 22, And the glory which thou hast given me, which thou givest me, I have given them that they may be one, as we are one as we are one then it says in verse 23 i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one the unity is calling us to it's not the unity that will say hey come on now tolerate my imperfection and i will accept your imperfection and will be united together Tolerate my childishness. I will accept your childishness. We'll be united together. Tolerate my immaturity, my eccentricities. 
and I will tolerate your inefficiency and your immaturity and we'll be united together no that they may be made perfect in one that, that's the reason why many of us who study the Bible and we say this is the prayer of Jesus he wants us united but it's not unity without a purpose unity without a goal and unity without perception that this is the kind of unity he wants and I pray that as the Lord is giving us understanding we will be united together in Jesus name did I have an amen there amen it will happen in Jesus name we're looking at first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 unity the proper perception first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 now I beseech you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that ye all speak the same thing I beseech you, brethren, by the grace and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak, what? What? The same thing. That's the unity. Paul, what did you mean here? What I mean is, I've heard information that there is one in the Corinthian church that went to commit immorality with his father's wife and even though i'm not with you in the physical this is what i say and this is what i speak cast out that man from among you what's unity once we say that all the members of the church all the workers in the church all the leaders in the church all the ministers in the church all the preachers in the church that we all speak the same thing so that a sinner will not have a hiding place so that a sinner will not say i run from church a because the pastor there he just keeps to the word of god he doesn't modify it he doesn't know that this is not so he doesn't know that you know where the human weaknesses his own weakness is adultery that other person's weakness is drunkenness. That other person's weakness is slander and gossip. And he is not a pastor. He doesn't know how to gather people together, keep them together, tolerate immorality and tolerate fornication, tolerate adultery and tolerate homosexuality. He's not a good pastor. A pastor is somebody who is able to gather people together and whatever they do is say god bless you children god bless you children god prosper you children that's a pastor he doesn't have a pastor's heart he's only a teacher now paul the apostle said cast him out eject him out of the fellowship and unity means we all speak the same thing so that the sinner will know the backslider will know he doesn't have any hiding place and when somebody does something wrong and the father says hey that's wrong don't do that again everybody unity means we all speak the same thing not while somebody a leader a pastor is rebuking and say this is not right the other people are clapping and they say do more of that that's great that's wonderful the sinner will not repent if we do that Backsliders will not repent if we do that. We must all speak the same thing. That's what the Lord is telling us. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Proper perception of scriptural unity. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent i may hear of your affairs that she stand fast in one spirit and one with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel that's the unity the essential nucleus focus of our unity is the gospel that jesus died for sinful man 
and that no man can save himself that is Jesus and Jesus alone that saves and he says now we are gathered together with that gospel we are lifting up that gospel we are embracing that gospel together we are striving to push forth and reach out to the world with that gospel with one spirit one attitude and with one mind that's the unity is calling us to and you know when you say we're united are we united like that the same gospel preaching the gospel propagating the gospel let's say for example you find that i've not been around for a month i've not been in nigeria i've been to this and to this and to that other place are you interested in the places i have gone or are you just saying where have you gone what are you doing we don't agree with you come on here stay here you have had the gospel a hundred times a thousand times and there are people who have not had wars and the lord is saying i died for everybody and if you have had it 300 times if you have had it a thousand times and then we we take the time out and to spend a week or to spend a month somewhere and tell people that they're saying huh is this in the bible uh-huh we never read this we never saw this and they're saying aha tell us more and then the people are giving their lives to the lord and then when you come back home it's like we don't agree with you what are you doing stay with us here that we will hear the same over and over and over why don't we strive together with the gospel why didn't you come to ask me pastor how can we help what can we do other people elsewhere they're asking they're saying can we do this can we do this can we do that i was saying well it's possible but when we come back home even to report back and to say well this is what i've done it's like are we interested in what you have done are we interested in where you have gone we're not interested in that what we're interested in is staying here so that we'll be enjoying our fellowship together and i'm saying that the reason for our unity is so that we'll be able to push the gospel together we're going to do it i said we're going to do it with one spirit and with one mind that means we're not going to be discouraging one another discouraging one another as to say if you don't stay here and tell us one thousand and one times one thousand and ten times and leave those other people that have not heard even only once if you don't leave them alone we're not going to be in agreement with you the agreement of the unity is that with one mind one spirit we're striving together to publicize the gospel and then you should be asking can we help can we do anything can we go there with you is there any space for another person to get this done to get that done that's the unity that the lord is talking about i remember many years ago we wanted to go and have a program in um, you know one of the states in nigeria and i sent uh, you know one of the choir masters and i said please go there i went there about a week before i got there and trained those people and when we got there even the congregation in that state they were surprised because they never had an orchestra like that before and then another time i wanted to go to south africa and i sent another i sent his choir master he said, please go there because i knew that they didn't have anything at all and I'd fed that brother spent I think, a week or two over there before I got there. And you see the singing. It was marvelous. That's the unity we're talking about. And the opportunities are still there. That, you know, I will not be the only one doing this and doing this and doing that. And then nobody is saying, can we join? Can we help? I pray we'll be united in the right direction in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, I'm reading there from verse, I'm reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Like-minded according to the evaluation, according to the measure, and according to the judgment of christ that will be one like-minded together look at verse 6 that 
ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. That's the unity with one mind and with one mouth. That anywhere we are, my mind is your mind, your mind is my mind, his mind is our mind together with one mind and with one mouth to glorify. And when we're glorifying the Lord, that means we're leading people to experience the glory of God. We're helping people to experience the power of the Lord. We're helping people so that the honor of the Lord and the glory of the Lord will be experienced by them. And it says, we do that with one mind. We do that with one mouth. So that the glory of the Lord will be experienced everywhere. But seven, wherefore receive ye one another. As Christ also received us to the glory of God. Philippians 2 verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love. Being of one accord and of one mind. And you see here the kind of unity the Bible talks about. One accord, one mouth, one spirit, one mind, one love. The same love. Let nothing be done through strife of vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves that's unity when there is no carnal comparison you know in our church we have many kinds of workers and we don't have any carnal comparison which one is greater the pastor or the singers the singers or the orchestra the men or the women the full-time workers or the volunteer workers, the children church workers or the youth workers, the campus or the coordinators, the pastors of the of local districts. Which one is more important? Hey, that's the same as asking me which one is more important, the head or the feet. Would rather have head and no feet. Which one's more important? The ear or the eyes. We rather prefer to have ears and not have not have eyes the mouth or the fingers which one is more important we say no one is not more important than the other they are all necessary they are part of the body and so all the canal comparisons this one is better this one is higher if i'm not there nothing will be done don't think like that again. You are important. I'm important. We're all important together. In understanding the unity of the church, the hand will help the mouth. You know what if, uh, you know, the mouth is, the hand doesn't taste the food. The legs or the feet, they don't taste the food. And the eyes don't taste the food. And the ears, they don't taste the food. And then there was a secret, let's say there's a secret kind of uh, meeting, committee meeting somewhere. And they're saying, you know what? I think we need to teach uh, this mouth, the one that's always talking, always chewing, always tasting, always digesting, always, you know, getting the food inside. We're going to teach him a lesson. He's going to know that although the food is passing through his, the mouth, that we are important too. And the legs say, what are you talking about? I'm even tired. Walking to the market, coming back from the market. And then I'm the one that is, you know, getting the food in. And then I never have any taste of the food. And the hand says, what are you talking about? When you go to buy the food and you walk and walk and walk, am I not the one peeling all the, you know, onions and everything? I'm going to stop peeling for a short time. And then the other one talks about, he says, now you people, leg and hand, you don't know what you're talking about. If I didn't open these sharp eyes to see and show you direction to go to the market and then to come back what are you going to have and then the backbone is saying hey i hear you i know what you are talking about 
eyes, uh -huh. you can see well. Leg, you can walk well. Eyes, you can peel onion and tomato and whatever it is. Eat me the backbone. If I didn't allow you to carry that basket of something, where will you be? And anyway, we are united together. The mouth is not here. He is the one we even have something against. And therefore, we all, we all go on strike. And then the leg will not go to the market. Hands will not peel any potato. And the eyes will not see any way to the market. And the backbone says, I'm on holidays. Well, yes, the mouth will suffer no food and then the stomach is saying hey what is happening mouth he said i haven't got any food uh, you know since uh, about a week now and then all the veins and the blood passing blood cannot pass blood to the heart and then that is affecting the weakness of the hand and the weakness of the leg and then the weakness of the eyes and it's like what we have decided to do in a committee meeting that will make everybody go on strike so as to punish the mouth it's like the result is it will weaken the whole body and the leg will say huh, if i don't want to die i think i need to continue walking to the market and the hands will say if i don't want to get weakened until i die i think i need to begin to peel my potatoes again and then the eyes will say i'm ready I'm walking, I'm seeing now, let's go to the market. Everybody united together again. That is how the body will survive. And the body of Christ, the church, that is how this church will survive. Do your part. I do my part. Let him do his part. Let him do his part. The leg doesn't hinder the hands. The mouth doesn't block the eyes. The ears do not disturb the nose. We have to breathe when every part allows every other part to do their part successfully. That's how the body is going to be strong. This church will be strong in Jesus' name. I said we shall be strong in Jesus' name. No comparison. What I'm doing, what you're doing. And no envy no jealousy what you are doing what i'm doing what you are doing is the best for you to do the best for the body what i'm doing is the best for the body and together team together everybody accomplishes more look at verse 4 look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus I pray that that mind will be in us in Jesus name Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace it's going to take some discipline diligence some determination endeavor to keep the unity of the body in the bunch of peace verse 13 till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god look at the unity here the proper perception of scriptural unity what is it number one unity of the faith unity of the faith now that you believe this i believe another thing unity of the faith not only that number two unity of the knowledge of the son of god what christ knows we know you know i know we all know together unity in knowledge and then it says unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine but by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive the lord wants us to be united together in thought in mind in spirit in mouth in work in understanding in striving for the gospel together first peter chapter 3 verse 8 finally be all of one mind all of one mind all of one mind it's with our mind we think. Let's think together. With our mind will plan. Let's plan together. 
It's that that gives all the courage to move ahead. Let's move on together. Let there be the unity for the gospel and for reaching out to the people of the world, bringing them into the kingdom. It says, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful and be courteous. Point number three, profitable promotion through sustained humility. Profitable promotion through sustained humility. It wants us to understand that promotion comes not to the people who struggle and fight and push other people down and exhort themselves. Promotion comes to the people that are humble, that make themselves as the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2 again. Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation. You know what, what brings trouble, what brings disunity and discord among the people of God? When I'm looking for reputation, when you're looking for recognition, I'm doing a lot, I'm not recognized. I'm contributing a lot, I'm not recognized. If they don't recognize how important my service is, voluntarily, they'll recognize it by force. Jesus didn't do that. That's not humility. That's pride. It says he made himself of no reputation. And then we're told, and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, humbled himself, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him promotion god also has highly exalted him you know what if we try to exalt ourselves we we'll become obnoxious people will see through that people will turn back and they'll say that lady is proud that man is proud they don't want to withdraw from you when you demand that exaltation from people but when you serve other people they appreciate the service you're doing the best for everybody and they will appreciate that that's what will bring promotion and god also will recognize that and give the promotion at the right time in james chapter 4 james chapter 4 verse 6 but God, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. He resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. And you don't want God to resist you, to throw you away, to abandon you. And okay, if you are so good by yourself, without my grace, without my help, if you are so qualified and so skilled, having this great ability, and you ought to be popular even without my help, okay, go ahead without my help. Go ahead without my support. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. And go and be great without my partnership with you. You don't want God to do that to you. It says, God resists the proud, but give it grace to the humble. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up the promotion comes the exaltation comes after the humility first Peter chapter 5 first Peter chapter 5 verse 5 likewise ye younger submit yourselves unto the elder the scripture that's even in our that's even in our culture here in Africa, not really in Nigeria, when you see elderly people, older people are old enough to be your father, old enough to be your mother, we show the respect. That's not culture, and not just culture. This is the Bible. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye all of you, be subject one to another, 
and be clothed with humility for God resisted the proud but giveth grace to the humble verse 6 humble yourselves therefore because of the exaltation that comes from the hand of the Lord to the humble it says because of that humble yourselves honor the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season we're looking at Matthew chapter 18 Matthew chapter 18 reading from verses 3 and 4 Matthew chapter 18 verses 3 and 4 hear the word of God from the Lord Jesus Christ and said verily I say unto you except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child that's the word of the Lord unto you unto me and we have no reason to say well Jesus I would have obeyed you but I want to prove something to my landlord Jesus thank you for your salvation and thank you for everything you have done for me I, I know what you are saying I know the interpretation of the word I know what you have said I would have obeyed but I want to prove something to my head teacher my principal at school I would have obeyed you but Lord my husband has been behaving funny you know recently and I want to prove a point to my husband I want him to understand something he doesn't understand but if I'm humble now I'll not be able to prove my point Lord Jesus you know my wife is you know acting this way and that way I would have obeyed you I really want you I love you I'm your child I'm born again I would have obeyed you but I want to prove a point to my husband this man needs you know some sense drilled into him and because of that today I cannot obey now this week I cannot obey now this period I cannot obey now there's a point I need to prove how are you going to be a real disciple of Christ when because of your husband because of your wife because of your teacher and because you're proving a point to your principal and because of so and so you're saying Lord you have not offended me but I'm going to take it on you I'm going to disobey your word so I can prove a point to brother so and so and sister so and so and the Lord is saying you are punishing me because so and so offended you you are dishonoring me because so and so offended you you are casting my word aside because you want to prove a point to so and so don't you do that let him be Lord let him be God it says whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven I pray God will make you great I say God will make you great the lower you go the higher he will exalt you and the more you make yourself a servant of all the more he will give you even things you have not been praying for great things will come to you in Jesus name the power the courage the boldness the fearlessness and the spirit that makes you more than a conqueror he'll grant unto you in Jesus name let's come back to John chapter 17 verse 9 I pray for them I pray not for the world but for them which thou hast given me for they are thine verse 20 neither pray I for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one the Lord Jesus prayed for you prayed for me prayed for us together as a team as a church together everybody accomplishes more won't you allow the prayer of Jesus to be answered are you going to push Christ and his prayer aside and then go your own way in religion religion without Christ no honor for Christ no recognition of Christ where will that lead me or lead you or lead us let's come and bow the knee before the Lord and say Lord you pray for your church to be one by your